So getting the screens back up and running up here, or no, <laughs> I've broken it again, I'm sorry. So uh, forgive us if we're looking over our shoulders at uh, certain points in this. What, uh, what we've done this afternoon is put together a, a session on scholarly communication in the Global South. This also ties in with the, the workshop some of you have been attending. Um, I just wanted to sort of, I guess, give you a couple of thoughts as to why I think, and I think we as an advisory board think this is important. So firstly, you know, what we are seeing in so many aspects of today is a move away from the kind of Europe, North American centric approach to the world. And that's as true in research as in any other uh, aspects. Oh, thank you, Mark, excellent. Any other aspect of today's world. So we often talk about China and China's recently overtaken the US as the largest uh, producer of research publications. But actually, if we look beyond China, it is been very much a similar growth story happening in India. So the last couple of years, India has overtaken the UK, Japan and, and Germany and now produces uh, the third largest number of research publications each, each year. So there's some very significant growth happening in many parts of the world. But I think the second reason it's important for us to look at beyond Europe, North America is the huge imbalances that we still see uh, in society and in scholarly communication. So those of you in the workshop this morning will have seen a slide from Andrea which showed that the top 10 countries produce vastly more uh, research articles than the remaining 200 countries in the world. So I think anything that we can do to address those imbalances in, is important. And the decisions and the actions that are taken by publishers and librarians and researchers in the West do have ramifications uh, across the whole rest of the world. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what our two speakers have to say. So we have Siva Umapathy, prefers to be known as, as Uma, who we'll be hearing from first, and also Dr. Hasib. Ufanula. So Uma is director of the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research in Bhopal, also chair of the Department of Inorganic and Physical Chemistry. Now beyond this, he has so many qualifications, fellowships and awards that I had to edit his biography very carefully just to fit it within the conference program. But genuinely, we're really delighted to have you with us. Um, very prestigious scientist. I think you were listed in the top 25 scientists in India a few, a few years ago. You qualify for your own Wikipedia page, which for me is always an important signifier. So thank you very much for being with us, and I'll hand over to you now. OK, so first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this meeting. I must uh, thank the Royal Society of Chemistry for supporting uh, to come to this conference. And I must congratulate all of you because I'm a practicing academic uh, working in physics and chemistry interfacial areas of biology and medicine. Um, so for me, this is just an eye opener. I can't believe the publishers are sitting and talking about the future. I thought they just publish and make money. Um, I'm really happy actually, I have to say, because I'm sitting and listening to many of your questions and discussions. Uh, I, you know, apart from attending uh, editors meeting and editorial board meeting of journals where we meet one or two members of a publishing organization, uh, we don't know about how these publishers work together in the world. But it's good that, you know, in a way, I have an opportunity to speak to you about the practices that we have in the so-called global south. As he said, the emerging economies is what I would like to call it. Uh, there are a large number of issues, but I have to say, you know, I'm, I'm for the last uh, about eight, or eight months, I'm now heading an institution in India, which is called a premier institute. So I am actually have to be careful about what I say, uh, because I work for the government now. Uh, being a professor is easy, but being a head of an institution, uh, we are supposed to maintain certain kind of uh, decorum in terms of what we say about our country, our institution. So I wanted to say clearly that what I'm going to tell you now is purely my personal opinion. Um, so it's nothing to do with the government of India, although I attend a lot of meetings with the ministers and secretary uh, in terms of funding research uh, in India. But uh, so I wanted to clear that it's, you know, if you're going to write anything about what I say, it's clearly it's my personal opinion. So that's what I wanted to tell you. Um, so, you know, so my talk, I just thought that I'll briefly put together a set of titles 
where I'll talk about South versus North, why South is important, what are the issues in the South or, or so-called emerging economies, and then the unique challenges a researcher faces in, in, the, in, the, in the emerging economy environment. I'll give you an example of India as a case study. I've been there about 28 years. I did my PhD in New Zealand, then I was in Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in Oxford for four years between 86 and 90, and then 90, I went back to India as a faculty, then I stayed there, and of course, you know, every year I come here and spend time, and of course, all over the world as a typical academic. So I can talk about the potential issues. I have a number of friends in the West who actually do the same thing as what I do, so I can compare myself with the Western world, and so I can show you what are the difficulties that we are facing and what are the possible issues that you may have to con uh, confront as you're actually evolving your program. So when you talk about South versus North, research funding, you know, if you ask uh, governments in, in, the, in the Western world, you know, Europe or US, the funding is related to innovation and knowledge development. You know, there is, there is nothing like a, so, you know, government can easily say, uh, you, let the PhD students go get loans. Or they can tell the students in, in colleges to say, go ahead, if you want to study in my university, you pay for it. Uh, in government of India or in other countries, you know, it's a social responsibility. The money spent in a university is more to bring the people up above the poverty line or into, into front line. So 99% of universities in India and most of the other countries are, are um, heavily subsidized education because taxpayers pay for uh, salaries and, and maintaining universities, which means the research funding also comes from institution or the government like that. And the other problem about uh, southern countries is that there's enormous diversity in terms of richness and diversity, there are extremely rich people, top 1% or 2% of, 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 the, of the country, and then there is very, very poor people. And of course, cities, some cities, if, you, if, you're, if you've ever traveled, if you come to India, you will see Bangalore is as good as London. You know, there's nothing you cannot get in Bangalore. This, the, the internet access is as good as what is in London. And of course, you can live like as if you're living in London if you live in Bangalore city. But of course, you have to go into another small town interior then you have no access, internet is extremely slow, buses don't run on time, you know, there are other issues that come into picture. But of course, the university education cannot be distributed, you know, located in one place, it's distributed across all over. So even university standards are very largely different from one end to the other. And that's the other problem we have. Now, you know very well that in most, most places, even in small towns, I can tell you by experience, I go and interview students, uh, school leaving students to give scholarship. You know, we give about 4,000 scholarship to Indian students when they finish 12th standard. They are all outstanding in the sense that uh, they write an examination and then out of some 20,000, they're about, about 400,000 students write the examination. We select 20,000 out of the examination result. We interview them. After interview, we choose 4,000 students. They are called a KVPY fellowship. Um, don't worry about what it is. The idea is that these students are interviewed for half an hour to 45 minutes by a group of uh, a, a mathematics teacher, physics teacher, chemistry teacher, a biology teacher. Four people sit in a room, interview the candidate right at the forefront of the school final examination. And so these, uh, these 4,000 students are extremely bright, as good as in Oxford or Stanford or MIT, because I've interacted with these students in all places. So I can tell you they're outstanding. But what is interesting is that some of these students come from villages, small towns. They're very sharp, very intelligent. But of course, they don't, because of financial conditions, because of the environment or the family background, they do not have access to the top institutions in the country. So in terms of uh, merit and quality, sometimes the merit and quality is associated with the access that you have in terms of educational institution and therefore the education itself. Cost of education and research, of course, you know, so if you're, you know, better institutions, of course the subsidized institutions are there, but the best institutions get a lot of funding. The institution I come from is originally is the Indian Institute of Science, 
which is supposed to be the number one institute in India for the last 30, 40 years, has continued to be number one. So we get a lot of funding. I, I mean, I go make presentation to a committee, I get funding, I do my research. But you can't say that for the whole, whole of India, whole of, uh, whole of all other institutions. So one has to struggle to get in. I mean, to get into, for a PhD admission, we take, for example, in the chemistry division of Indian Institute of Science, we generally take about 30 students every year. We get 200,000 applications to take these 30 students. So we cut them off and ask, request only about 3,000 students to write the exam. Out of 3,000 students, we actually select 400 students for interview. We interview every student for half an hour to 45 minutes before we admit the student for a PhD in, in the institution. Because the PhD is paid. It's a full scholarship paid institution. So we don't pay that. The government pays it once if they come and join our institution. So that's not easy. So even if you're extremely bright, you may not get the best institution. So there are enormous talent available in this world. And of course, you know, today's world, one thing is happening more faster and uh, uh, more, more frequently is the intelligentsia or the ability to be successful in the world seem to be not necessarily because of your IQ, not because of the depth in the subject, more because of the amount of information that you have accessible to you. So a city student has much better internet access, much better environment, so he learns a lot both socially and intellectually, but not necessarily very deep in the subject, knows how to sell himself much better than, for example, a small town student who has very limited access to internet. So his access to information as to what's available in the world, what are the new fields are coming up, where should I go and do a PhD? These are all simple information, but it's not available. So therefore, your success, your ambition, and your expectation of your success does not just depend on your talent, but it's also depend on the information that is given to you and around you. So what are the challenges? As I said, I think I already mentioned this to you, choice of quality of research, where you go, how much, and limitations in funding. The funding is always subcritical in most of the conditions, you know, you, uh, because of so much of funding has to be distributed to too many people. Therefore, then they, uh, you know, I was, I was told by the chairman of a, I, I have sat on both sides of the committee. I have student made presentations, requests for funding. I sat on the other side giving money to people. And they always ask the question saying, look, you know, you're a well-funded guy. Why are you asking for more money? I mean, then I say, well, you know, we have to compete in the world, so we need more money. Then he says there are other people who need to be given funding. So you must be reasonable, so can you cut down your funding? So we do. I mean, we have to, we have to do this. So there is the, the choice of research topic is not necessarily always because funds are available. It's more on what is it that I can do with the funding that is available, that is given to me. These days, more importantly, for example, people like me are more worried about international recognition uh, but there are, there are other aspects of uh, questions by the parliamentarians and, and the politicians saying what is the relevance of this kind of research to the national needs. When you have 1.2 billion people, the economy is moving, the Prime Minister says, what can you do for India? What's the point of doing science for the world? So we, we hide under the blanket uh, uh, contribution of doing human resource development. We say, look, we are generating top class Indian students who actually do research in the international standards so they can move in and adapt themselves to various needs of India. Um, so, of course, you know, one of the questions that I was talking about is westernization versus nationalization. This is a very, very difficult concept, very difficult for any country to adapt and accept. You know, on the one hand, you can say that you you should compete in the world. On the other hand, you say, you know, what is that you're contributing to a country like India? And the needs are different. You see, for a country in, in the Western world, you, you are looking at, you know, can we go to artificial intelligence and robotics in medicine? And on the other hand, we are talking about in a country like India, about how do we take care of malaria and TB? So more important to keep the population alive and happy and be healthy rather than saying how best can we increase our surgery. So of course, you know, as I said before, big cities are at this level and small towns are, uh, so we have, we have a, a very large disparity in terms of technology development from small town to big cities. 
The other thing is that, you know, if you look at the statistics of, of number of students, uh, a country like India is, is, is really going through a, a very, very uh, difficult transformation period because in the 70s, as you probably know, the population growth was very large and uh, therefore uh, right now 40% of Indians, uh, Indian population is below 35. So the next generation of workforce of the world is going to come from India. This is what Indian government thinks and therefore the educational institutions are being uh, opened in many folds to make sure that the people who are graduating from schools have access to uh, higher education. If you go look at the demography of India, you will see almost 30% of them are below 20%, 20 years old. Therefore, we need to give them admissions in, in colleges and universities. And that's a major issue that we are actually right now facing. And of course, this is going to lead to more about research projects and publications and funding. The other thing about paid and copyrighted publications, you know, this I was just talking to Rob about this. You know, I, I'm sure many of you know this. There are there are a large number of, you know, once they realize that people are willing to pay to publish their journals, whether it is on the internet or in a printed form, uh, there are then smart business guys decide they want to start a publishing company. So this has happened in India. Quite a few uh, number of companies have started up, and. The other problem is that when somebody is paying to publish their paper, it gives an impression to people who are not experts in academics, who, you know, who is a bureaucrat, for example, doesn't understand, if you're doing great science, why can't you just publish it in the best journals? Why are you paying for it? So, you know, they, they are saying, look, open source, people must be able to read, you're not giving copyright, copyright available to everybody. And he says, I don't care about all that. So that's one end, you know. So what happens is when somebody publishes a paper and pays for it, then it says, okay, so if you're rich enough, you should be able to publish a large number of papers, right? I mean, if you have a journal, a printed version journal has, say, 100 pages can be printed in a particular issue, so you have to choose only 10 or 20 papers, so then the journal manages to reach the top. If you're going on the internet, of course, there's no limit. You can only publish 50, 500 papers, 500 uh, pages, in a, in a internet and of course if I'm willing to pay you a thousand dollars per paper you submit some ten papers in ten different journals and get it published so who controls who says what is the quality how do you decide that so when some university guy says how oh, I have to publish in nature communications one guy says sir I don't have money I, I don't know you know they're asking too much money to publish my paper in nature communication then the other guy says, who is supposedly well-funded, he manages to publish it. Of course, I can tell you uh, from Indian government's point of view that when we are giving funding or any research funding does not contain any component to pay for publishing in a journal, unlike the European US models. So which means that we have to have saved money in our exp research expenses to pay for the uh, expenses in the, in the journal. So I, I have papers in open source journals. I paid for it. I mean, of course, it goes through referees. You know, it does the same uh, processing. But of course, not everybody understands this. So there is a need to educate the public, the, the rationale behind uh, something like that. Uh, I mean, of course, Rob has already told you that India is publishing a lot. There's more and more pressure and, and of course, funding. Infrastructure is now coming to international standards. So if you come to Indian institutions, some of the top Indian institutions, at least the top 20, you will see they are as good as Oxford or Cambridge or even Stanford, as you would say. So in terms of infrastructure, it's very good. And of course, the payment for publication is a problem. Young researchers, you know, they apply for a proposal, they are paid money, but then of course, you know, they have to prove themselves that they are good in the first five years. And if they are good, they get more funding. But that's not, you know, as easy as it is said. And uh, as I said, the perception of a paid publications for a young faculty is not normally appreciated because people say, look, you can publish in, in American society journal or, or physical society journal. It doesn't ask you for any money. Uh, you can publish in royal society journals. So society journals are not charging, which are printed issues. Of course, society journals like Omega and uh, RSE advances, they are all, for example, are open source journals where you have to pay. But people tend to choose the journals in which they don't have to pay for it. I mean, if they're good, they prefer that. So I don't know where this is heading, but that's the status of uh, situation. 
as I said, predatory generals, there is a need to, need to monitor them. And, you know, the judgment. So today, if you look at the way the government decides to make, the guys normally who decides how much money is going to be invested in research and development, it's normally a bureaucrat. Bureaucrat who is well-educated, uh, who has been trained, but he may not be a scientist, but he could be a commerce expert who is a secretary for finance or something. And he decides how much are we going to now invest this year in R&D. Now, if he doesn't understand, you see, this is, this is something uh, publishers need to be aware and probably communicate with the, with the government, is to what, what is the status of publishing today in the world? What, why open source is coming up? Uh, NIH has mandated people to publish in open source, but NIH gives you money to pay for the open source publication. So, but that's not the true in, in, in Indian conditions. So that's, a, that's an issue that you need to look at. Um, for example, I've given RSC and ACS, you know, RSC, Royal Society of Chemistry, and the American Chemical Society have a very strong presence in India. I mean, in the last three years, they've, they've opened their offices there. They attend every chemistry meeting in India. They actually participate, in, invite them to invite the students to become member of these societies and offer them uh, scholarship or uh, publishing costs sometimes to people or they bring special issues issues so you have to become creative to deal with countries like India where we are somewhere in the middle between understanding open source publication versus uh, versus printed uh, journal publications or uh. and the other thing is about educating evaluators and referees I don't know you know now there was very little discussion today about referees um, I can tell you by experience as an editor and also being on the editorial board you know, it's not easy to get somebody to referee a paper anymore. I mean, you know, you send a paper to somebody and it, it, at least some of the papers takes six to eight referees before it's accepted for, for being refereed. Most senior guys, I mean, if you have friends who are senior professors, you know, including me, to ask, would you referee a paper? I will avoid it as much as possible, I can tell you. Because we get requests, at least three to four requests a day to referee a paper. So we choose which papers to referee based on which journal is submitting the paper and who is the editor who is sending the paper. Because I know him personally, therefore, you know, he should not feel offended if I say no to him because he knows it's my topic of my interest. So like that, refereeing has become a major problem. I, I, and so the quality of, therefore, what happens is you're going down the ladder in terms of the expertise that you're using to referee a paper. So sometimes very young faculty who just joined as an assistant professor, most of those people will be happy to referee because they would like to indicate to their organizations that I'm a referee for this particular journal, which adds to the value of their academic performance. But of course, you know, with limited experience of just fresh PhD, doesn't necessarily mean the actually evaluation is always correct. So I don't know whether how many of you know, you can ask your friends, People tend to call the editors and say, who is this guy who refereed this paper? He doesn't seem to have understood. I have done that myself. I have called my friend who is an editor in one of the top journals in the US. I sent him a mail saying, what kind of rubbish refereeing is this? So I would like to speak to you if it is possible. So he says, call me in half an hour in the evening after 7 o'clock Indian time. I called him up and I said, you know, read the sentences. I mean, he's obviously a novice. He's not an expert in the field. He said, how do you know? I said, you read. You can read and figure it out. You can read the comments, right? And then he says, yes, you're right. It's some young man. I said, come on, you know, this is not fair because, you know, the frontiers of science, then op opinions become very important. So you then share with some senior. I told him, can I, can I suggest two other names that you could talk to people? Then he said, okay, give me a few names. And, you know, so it is getting very difficult to get. So the quality of journals is going to depend on the quality of refereeing. And you must come up with creative ways to get referees. One way to do it, now that you're going open source, I have a recommendation, is that you tell them if you referee 10 papers, I'll give you 50% discount on your open source expenses. You will get more people refereeing for you. Um, so issues and solutions, for example, funding is subcritical. You know, now I'm an administrator. I look at the funding given to me for the whole institution, including construction of buildings, employing people, uh, maintaining security, maintaining infrastructure, plus I have to pay for the library. So this year, for example, the professors came and said they want to increase the library budget by another 
I said, no. So I said, I want you to make a presentation to me, say why you want to increase, add these journals to me, based on what papers you publish, how many papers are you citing in these journals. You know, faculties like to have as many journals as possible, but there's only limited budget. So we have to make a choice. And that choice has to be that is acceptable on, on all sides. So one of the suggestions I had was, just a suggestion, you can decide what you want to do. The cost of these things, of course, you know, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a cost for you in making these journals and getting these papers published. But you should also look at, like agencies like American Chemical Society or the Royal Society, has subscriptions depending on country's income or GDP. So if, if somebody in the UK, to become a member of the Royal Society of Chemistry, they may pay 80 pounds or 100 pounds, and we people uh, in India, because although we may not directly benefit with everything that the Royal Society does in this country, there are some activities in India, we pay only 50 pounds. So there is a 50% discount for countries where the, the total uh, income is not very large. So some, some format has to come in if, the, if, the, if these countries have to participate in your, in your uh, system. So with this, I'll probably stop, and if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Uma. I'm sure there will be some questions, but I'm going to ask you just to hold those until after we've also heard from Hasib. So, Dr. Hasib Fanula, uh, you're a man of many talents, I think, Hasib. So a, a botanist, an ecologist, and a conservationist. Um, I know when we spoke a couple of months ago, you described yourself as a research communication enthusiast, though, and I, I think it's in that capacity that you're speaking with us today. So Hasib's had a long involvement in the development of journal publishing in Bangladesh, and uh, I look forward to hearing what you have to share with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, and uh, it's a really great honor and pleasure to be here. This is for the first time I'm attending this conference. And I thank the organizer as well as the sponsor for making it happen. Uh, I will be talking about Bangladesh, the research communication particularly. Uh, as uh, Professor Umapati talked about um, uh, India, the, one of the largest uh, country in the global south. He focuses more, mostly on the research as well as the communication, but my one will be uh, particularly taking Bangladesh as an example, uh, how, how things are actually being, uh, uh, what are the things are happening actually. I will be first talking about what, uh, what are the major developments over the last couple of decades in Bangladesh in terms of scholarly publishing. Then I will focus on, uh, uh, after all those efforts for the last two decades or so, how the journals are doing, I will be sharing some numbers. And I will try to explain why things are happening in that manner. And finally, we will be uh, uh, hearing some ideas how to improve it in a, towards a positive direction. So first of all, uh, I would like to share that uh, there are basically three fantastic developments happened over the last two decades or so. The first one is, we have heard it a lot, that access to uh, research publications or scientific publications. And uh, then uh, the, uh, the second major transformation happened was, uh, has been making local research available or visible globally. And the final one is related to capacity development of researchers as well as editors. So the first one, uh, accessing scientific publications, definitely there, have, there uh, have been quite a few global initiatives. Um, we have uh, heard a few of them. I will just mention two of them. Uh, Research for Life, definitely it has, been a, it has been doing a fantastic job bringing in, uh, uh, reaching out so many institutions uh, all over the world, more than 120 countries actually. And uh, the second one I would like to talk about is INASP. Uh, I have been volunteering uh, some of their initiatives. Uh, this is a much uh, smaller in term, uh, compared with uh, Research for Life, but uh, Bangladesh has been uh, greatly benefited out of these kind of uh, programs. Uh, and uh, INASP uh, uh, still continuing with uh, other programs, uh, helping the librarians, researchers, uh, editors, building their capacity as well as uh, giving access to information. 
And definitely, over the last couple of decades, ICT, it, it has been, you know, it, it has a, there has been revolution. And uh, we, uh, in Global South, definitely got benefited out of it. That brings in the second point, the transformation, that making local research available globally. Many Bangladeshi publishers, uh, they uh, do have their online platforms so that they can actually share uh, their uh, journals uh, globally. But one interesting thing happened uh, in 2007 when INAS launched their program called Journals Online. This particular program actually helped, uh, for example, Bangla Jol, it actually an abbreviated form of Bangladesh Journals Online. And it helped Bangladeshi journals to, to get a kind of a platform where uh, bringing in quite a few journals together. And uh, most of them actually didn't have any website back then. Uh, and at the moment, there are 142 journals being hosted on this platform. And I'm sh I can assure you, there are much more journals which, uh, which are being published but not included in this particular platform. And there are thousands of full text uh, available there. And uh, my journal, Bangladesh Journal of Plant Taxonomy, uh, I can, I can, I can uh, say it quite proudly that through that exposure, Bangladesh Journal of Taxonomy became only one of four journals we, from Bangladesh with JCR impact factor. And we, uh, get, we uh, first got it in 2010, just three years after we joined uh, this uh, platform, Bangladesh. Now the third transformation is capacity development. And I would like to share with you what happened over the last 10 years or so. Bangladeshi counterpart of INASP, Bangladesh Academy of Sciences, came together with one of, uh, of INASP's project, Author8, and they started building the capacity of the researchers through training, organizing workshops. I have got chance to facilitate and design a few of them. They also focused on editors, improving their understanding, what do we mean by international standard in publishing industry? Uh, what do we mean by equitable research system? Uh, how, to, how to use the uh, online system? Because back in you know, last decade, at the end of last decade, it was quite new. So they, they, they were trained up. But it is not like that uh, those organizations are doing everything on their own. They were also providing grants to other agencies. And gradually, different agencies, different institutions, research organizations, they started uh, uh, using their own money to build the capacity of their researchers because they, f they felt that it has got something, to, they, they need to do it. I would like to talk about a particular project I got involved in. It was funded by USAID. And the idea was they will be picked, uh, this is called Gobeshana. Gobeshana is the Bangla word for research. And they picked up uh, 20 uh, young researchers who completed their climate change research but haven't published yet. So every year for three years, altogether 60 researchers were picked up. They were trained, they were mentored over the year to get their research paper published in a peer review journal. And I'm quite, uh, quite happy to be part of that venture. Of course, not all the 60 actually got, uh, got it through, as you understand. One third of them actually could publish in a peer review journal. And the final uh, interesting things happening, NGOs, they are also coming in, like Oxfam, like uh, a local Bangladeshi uh, NGO, CCDB. They are coming forward and taking research and communicating it uh, for, the, for the betterment of their uh, program implementation, as well as convincing donor that things are working. But there was one thing was missing in all these things. All the activities were quite sporadic, and there wasn't any uh, concerted effort, you know, together. So, an attempt was made just a couple of years back, bringing in the editors of uh, uh, 30, uh, 30 editors, actually, journal editors, who are involved in Bangla Jol. And a dialogue was organized, which was ended with a roadmap. How can we collectively, together, improve the journal publishing ecosystem in Bangladesh? But very interestingly, nobody took the lead. The organizations who organized it, they actually couldn't actually own it probably. This is my explanation. 
uh, and there wasn't any leadership, true leadership. So actual collective uh, implementation of roadmap didn't happen. So the second point, after all these things, and uh, getting access to publishing, getting capacity, uh, being, uh, getting the, the capacity being uh, built, how are we doing actually as a, as a whole? I will show you two examples or uh, two assessments which, will, which might explain us how Bangladeshi journals are doing. The first one is there is a database called uh, JPPS, uh, Journal Publishing Practices and Standard. It was launched in late 2017. Uh, it was a joint venture of uh, African Journals Online and INASP. What do they do? They, they assess all the journals being uh, hosted on five different journals online. They are from Bangladesh, Cambodia, Mongolia, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. And they categorize them in six different categories. The best ones who, which meet, uh, meets uh, all the criteria, they get three stars, then the uh, two star, then one star. If a journal is not being published regular, on a regular basis, if it, is not, it hasn't been published in the last one year, they call it inactive. So it doesn't mean, inactive means they're not doing anything. They are not regular enough. They are, they are missing their issues being published uh, for the last uh, year or so. Interestingly, from Bangladesh, almost 50% of the journals got the inactive, were, uh, were categorized as inactive because they are not publishing issues on a regular basis. Only seven out of 142, which is only 5%, actually got two stars. What about the global result? In all those five journals online, there, there are, at the moment, 419 journals published from five, five different countries. They at least, they got at least, uh, they're also not uh, doing that well, you, you can understand, but at least their percentage of getting uh, two stars is 11%. So Bangladesh, even among the developing uh, nations, is not quite uh, there. So the second one, to assess how Bangladeshi journals are doing, I uh, surveyed 30 odd journals twice. They were, they were kind of randomly selected. Uh, one in 2016, at the end of one, 2016, and the last one I did in November. I will show you some slides very quickly. The right-hand side, it shows that almost, I mean, all the journals are being published online. They also get uh, uh, printed copies. So the right-hand corner, uh, the right, uh, the, the, the right-hand uh, bar chart, bars actually showing both the they are they are publishing both in print as well as uh, online. And the processing manuscript processing time is quite uh, quite okay. You know, most of the journals actually publishes, uh, I mean, process uh, process their um, uh, submissions within five months or so. And timeliness, they're not doing quite well, as I have just mentioned, which, which actually matches what we got from JPPS, that they're struggling, actually. They're also struggling to upload or making the journal's uh, issues available online. So uh, if we ask that how international Bangladeshi journals are, which is kind of weird, isn't it? But still, uh, not many journals actually uh, have got uh, Foreign, foreign researchers or experts on the editorial board, but they do publish papers by uh, international authors, and they do ex uh, explore uh, or uh, get uh, or seek the expertise from reviewers from different countries and others. They are doing quite, uh, uh, quite, quite okay. In terms of indexing, being indexed, we are not doing at all, good at all. 50% of our journals are not indexed by even a single agency, as the survey shows. And in terms of payment, you can understand the left-hand side, more than 50%, almost 70% of the journals, they are not charging anything, anything at all uh, to the authors. When they charge, they actually charge very, you know, sometimes it is very rare to charge uh, uh, handling fee or 
usually the charge, you know, color plate or this kind of uh, 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 fees. Why is that? Because most of the journals, I mean, almost all of the journals are being supported by a particular institution or a learner society. As you can see, the, to, to bring a journal issue out is very, very cheap. It is just above 800 pounds, actually, to bring out an issue. Because everybody is volunteer. I will show you the next slide. Uh, so it is, the range is also, as you can see, sometimes if it is online, only 200 pound is enough to publish a journal in Bangladesh. And that's why not all journals have got their designate offices or staff. Even they have a staff, they are often volunteers, not paid at all. So you can understand why we are, uh, they are actually cutting the cost. So if we just summarize that many of the journals are doing more or less okay in certain criteria, uh, in terms of uh, timeliness, in terms of um, being international, in terms of reaching out, but most of the journals are actually struggling. But uh, the third point is, uh, I would like to share that why we are seeing this particular situation. I have two explanations. The first thing is uh, Bangladeshi journals Although being, it's a part of the global uh, scholarly uh, uh, publishing system, but it has kind of a, it has, it has made out a way how to thrive in a kind of a, uh, isolation. I'm calling it a relative uh, scholarly isolation. I will explain that in a bit. And another thing is this isolation is actually linked to with how the scholar, scholars as well as their society as a whole uh, perceives research, researcher, and research communication. Uh, let us uh, define isolation in a scholarly publishing. What I'm trying to say that in Bangladesh, most the journal publishing industry is self-sustaining, both financially and content-wise. As I have shown you, that the publishing cost or running cost is very very low, and it is being covered by the even the, by the government. Government actually pays. Uh, if you apply, if you have a journal, you will get some money from the government. So it is enough for them. The second one is content-wise. Whatever the manuscript they are getting locally, it is sufficient to uh, get, uh, get an issue out. And the situation that has been prevailing now, the researchers, they are okay with it because they are getting their promotion. They are uh, getting increments and other recognition they are actually looking for. As a result, there is no real need or motivation or incentive to improve the journal publishing um, system uh, in Bangladesh to improve it. Now, regarding perception, uh, not all hardcore research are being uh, receiving due attention by the politicians as well as by the media. Sometimes it happens in agriculture. You know, Bangladesh is an agriculture-based uh, country. Economy is mostly agriculture-based. Uh, and sometimes we get uh, enough attention when, uh, if we talk about, say, uh, cutting-edge uh, discovery, like, say, uh, genome sequencing. Uh, uh, it happened that uh, certain uh, genome sequencing of certain plants or animals, since it was related to patenting or it was related to kind of national pride, like jute, which is a kind of a very important uh, for us, uh, a particular crop, cash crop. So it, 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 it received media attention quite, quite, quite a lot. And uh, definitely sometimes uh, the society thinks that uh, researchers are kind of thinkers rather than real change makers. Uh, I don't want to say that the politicians are only thinking that, but it is a kind of a general per perception. Sometimes the decision making, development decision making, we, uh, we often don't see that hardcore research outputs have got some, some uh, strong role to play in it, especially in Bangladesh. And career issue of researcher is one of the uh, points uh, to have that kind of perception towards research, research communication, and researcher. And the final point I would like to make here, uh, just a couple of weeks back, I tried to look into different promotions rule, uh, rules to promote uh, uh, lecturers and prof, uh, you know, associate professors in, five, in seven different universities of Bangladesh, public university of Bangladesh. 
And I found that there is no mentioning of international journals, index journals, or journals uh, with impact factor in those rules, because the rules are quite old. They haven't updated it uh, since. Uh, there has been an attempt uh, uh, one year back by the UGC, uh, University Grants Commission of Bangladesh, where it's, it's tried to uniform and make the assessment process of promotion uh, kind of an advanced one, but unfortunately it hasn't been uh, implemented yet. It is still um, in, the, uh, in the shelf or, uh, uh, yeah. And I would like, I'm not sure whether uh, I can, I can, it's a kind of a, kind of a feeling that I have. International mechanisms to ensure uh, journal quality, uh, probably it has got limited scope to break this kind of isolation, kind of self-imposed isolation, I would say. Only 18 journals of Bangladesh are ranked in SJR. Uh, nine journals are included in PubMed. And only four journals, as I have mentioned, has got JCR uh, impact factor. So the question is how to improve this situation. Definitely, uh, that kind of isolation uh, is not good for, uh, um, you know, for the whole, whole country and whole system. I, have, uh, I, I uh, would propose two uh, streams of uh, activities. First one is we need to bring all the stakeholders, researchers, editors, policymakers, coordinating agencies together, and they need to talk to each other. It doesn't happen that often in Bangladesh. And that will actually help them uh, in terms of elucidating certain myth, uh, certain misunderstanding. Uh, sometimes they are not quite aware of what is going on, as we have heard uh, in the morning, uh, plan S, and uh, just uh, before the tea break, um, how AI can be actually uh, uh, changing the whole uh, scenario. We also need to give them the idea that where Bangladesh is positioned uh, in terms of uh, research globally, that kind of sense of position is quite important. And uh, when you talk, when you have uh, frequently discussed, uh, when um, that can actually help you to uh, develop a shared vision, I used to work for an international organization, environmental organization, and we have seen that transboundary, uh, it's a totally different arena, but transboundary water discussion is quite different, quite, quite sensitive in India, Bangladesh, Nepal, China. But when you bring people together, they, they continue uh, talking about it, that actually help them to create a common vision. That can be used here. And we can also use the reverse psychology, uh, kind of, what Bangladesh is missing due to having that kind of isolation? Uh, how is it hurting them? Uh, you know that IPCC, which is a, a global, uh, globally recognized report, you know, which, is being, uh, which, uh, which brings out uh, reports, uh, sorry, IPCC is an agency, intergovernmental panel on climate change. Every five years or so, they, uh, they bring out uh, a report. There was an assessment in 2014 that in that particular report, Bangladeshi, that the problem of Bangladesh due to climate change was ref referred to like anything. 70% of the research work was done by foreigners. That fact actually instigated to have that project I mentioned, Gobeshana, in 2015. So uh, that kind of, you can, we, can, we can always uh, convince the researcher and policy makers that what we are missing out uh, due to having that kind of uh, scholarly isolation. The second trend is only dialogue will not work. We have to have some concrete actions. And uh, since the problem is within the country, we have to bring the uh, uh, national system which, which, which might actually solve the problem. So to have uh, political backing, we need to think how the government is thinking. For example, uh, we have talked about SDG. Bangladesh government is very serious about achieving the targets of SDG. And it is all the ministries, they are monitoring how they are doing on each of 169 targets. I have been involved with SDG 15. So we can actually link scholarly publishing with 
government's monitoring system, that might actually help to uh, get the due um, political background um, support. We need to have some policy or regulations or guideline. Uh, I, I would like to call it National Science, uh, Science Journal Publishing Rule that can be led by our science ministry, uh, science and technology and support from the education ministry that can actually define what kind of journals can be published from Bangladesh. And that could be linked with the promotion rules of the university and research organizations. Otherwise, it will not work. And that can be um, overseen by a kind of uh, Bangladesh Journal Watch, which can, be, can monitor and assess whether the rules are being implemented properly or not. But only governance shouldn't work just, just, uh, just to dictate people what to do and what not to do. We should also have kind of a support desk or support system so that the editors, the researchers can actually uh, improve their quality and competency, co competence. So if I sum up, uh, as I said, that despite being a part of the global uh, scholarly system, Bangladesh uh, has got some kind of uh, uh, isolation. And international system which uh, currently exist might not be enough to, uh, to, to uh, remove that kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the barrier. So we need to have a kind of a, uh, we need to improve the situation so that uh, through dialogues, policy and institutional support. The last slide is not because I would not want you to ask me any questions, but still I'm asking you some questions. What is your thought actually? Uh, uh, the assessment that I have proposed, uh, I have shown you, and the recommendations I have proposed, uh, will it be sufficient? Will it be enough, uh, effective? Uh, will it work actually? And uh, uh, do you have any other experiences from other developing countries, for, for example, from Africa? Uh, continent. And finally, how can Global North can support Global South if that kind of isolation prevails? And that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Hasib. Um, I think that was fascinating, actually, that uh, I, I was just thinking when you were saying about promotions aren't dependent on journal impact factors and all this like a promised land isn't it for the <laughs> those of us in the west so I, I just we want to open it up for a for a few questions so we do have some mics so do put hands up if you have any questions for our speakers i'll maybe just kick off by picking up on that i think i think in both of your talks there's that sort of challenge of internationalization but that tension with national interests and that in some cases becoming more international can be to the detriment of, of national interests. I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about how you see things progressing in the in the coming years and whether you see India, Bangladesh bec becoming more open, more international, whether you'll see more of a retrenchment into national interests. Yeah, so India, you know, the, the top institutions, the top 20 institutions, most of the faculty are from all over the world. You know, these are all Indian students. Either they went to the US or came to Europe, did their PhDs, went abroad to somewhere else, and then came back. And so, like I did, you know. I did my PhD in postdoc abroad, and then I went back. So, the, the, the international quality, international development, contemporary research will continue. At the same time, you know, the requirement of uh, national related research is continuously being talked about, but it's not likely being pushed by research agencies, like funding agencies like EPSRC in this country or NSF in the US, you know. Um, there are other agencies within India which are supposed to work on national development uh, projects like Defense Agency, Space Agency, and there is a science and industrial research organization which actually does take projects like that. Um, the government of India is now trying to encourage industries to invest money in, in R&D. Uh, but of course, most of these is the initial stages. They, they don't invest large amount of money. They look at short-term gains rather than long-term. 
So things are very slow, although it's a good cliche that we must have a national development agenda. But most of it at the top levels are still very world centric, it's not national centric. Mm. Hasib, anything you'd add? Uh, in Bangladesh, uh, it is not like that from my presentation. It is not like that we don't have uh, world class research going on. I'm talk talking about those are not being published in Bangladeshi journals. I have heard, I have asked my friends, you know, uh, what do you do? Uh, don't you, don't you uh, publish, uh, you know, uh, your interesting work in uh, international journals? Yes. They say that uh, it depends upon the quality of research because sometimes they are uh, so much bogged down in. Uh, administrative work at the university plus teaching uh, but they can't actually give enough time to do research in their own lab so they then they prefer to work with the uh, uh, international counterparts so that collaboration gives out definitely high quality research and those are being published in international journals while the not so good ones are being submitted for quick public uh, quick publication, uh, I mean, uh, quick, quick um, uh, yeah, publication. Uh, so the same person is creating or continuing or maintaining the gap. We are trying to uh, minimize the gap, but this is, this is going on. But I think uh, in Bangladesh, uh, since Bangladesh is still a least developed country, but it is trying hard to become the middle income country, and investment in research is increasing. Uh, I think that there will be more and more uh, change scenario that I have just shown you. Uh, yeah, I, I'm quite, quite positive about it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the floor? And can you give your name and affiliation? I'm Danny Kingsley from Cambridge. Um, thank you to both of you for a very, very interesting talk. I'm just interested in the question about isolation of Bangladeshi uh, research publication. What about the readership? What are people reading in Bangladesh? Is it just Bangladeshi publications or are they reading internationally? Oh, definitely they are reading both Bangladeshi and international. As I have shown you that uh, access to international journals have increased immensely uh, through uh, Research for Life and other agencies and uh, other uh, platforms. Uh, but the problem is uh, our journals quality and bringing the standards up. That's the only, that's the biggest challenge. Accessing is no longer a challenge, I would say, given those uh, projects through international initiatives. Thank you. There's a hand there at the back, Mark. Uh, thank you, Mark Carden from Mosaic Executive Search, also amateur conference operator. Um, I wanted to ask a kind of naive question, I guess there are no dumb questions. Can I ask about language a little bit? Is, um, is this all English language publishing or is it some of it in Hindi and Bengali? Is all of it in Hindi and Bengali? I, I, I don't know what the landscape is. Uh, in case of Bangladesh, all the journals are English journals because I have shown uh, the 142 journals, those are uh, science journals, basically, there are, uh, uh, from humanities uh, sector, there are journals in Bangla, but their number is quite limited compared with science journals. Science journals, all are in English. No, same in India, actually. <laughs> They're all English journals, yeah, all in English, yeah. Okay. The question from Andrew. Thank you, and thank you very much for two great presentations. Um, it's Andrea Powell from Research for Life. Um, we heard this morning from Mark Schiltz that the Indian government was one of the governments that has uh, announced its support for Plan S. But Uma, you were talking about the fact that the Indian government doesn't provide funds for payment of APCs and other publication charges. Is that, do you see signs of that changing, or do you think they're kind of claiming support for Plan S, but not actually necessarily going to put the money behind it? It's very difficult. You see, I, the, I think that there are certain NGOs in India are pushing the government very hard um, to go for open source. You know, they're saying that you I mean, they've told me personally, I mean, the guy, I know the guy who's pushing this in India. He has told me that, look, you, you know, I, I try to argue with him saying that, look, it's not realistic for Indian scientists to go open source all the time. It's just, 
I'll tell you the reasons. Uh, I saw. I was. I. I was saying that. You know, I can. I can afford to do it because I have enough grants, but not everyone. But so his argument is, your funding and your salary comes from the taxpayers. So you are. You whatever you generate must be public domain. So you can't ask a normal person on the street to subscribe to a journal to read your paper or the work that is done by taxpayers. So fair enough argument. Now, if you look at consumable cost, you know, I, I don't know whether you're familiar with funding patterns in the world. So when I apply for a project to either EPSRC or to Indian agency, we ask for, uh, in the grant subsections, we ask equipment grant, and consumable grants or contingencies grant, and then manpower. Indian government, right, invariably, most projects, the consumable contingencies do not exceed ten thousand dollars. But in Indian rupees, it's quite a lot. That's about three, three, three hundred, three hundred thousand rupees. And sometimes you can get maybe you know five hundred thousand rupees. You know, if I have to publish a paper in Nature Communication, right? It's eight hundred dollars. Uh, I have totally only ten thousand dollars for the whole year to, to spend money on chemicals and all the other expenses of keeping my lab running. So, if the government has to say, tell me that you must publish all your paper in open source, I'm average publish five to seven papers a year. I'm looking at seven thousand, eight thousand dollars a year. So that means my consumable funding should double if I have to publish. And you can imagine government increasing funding, doubling research funding. So it's, it's right to say that we should publish open source and all that, but I'm not really sure it's going to happen. Um, because, you know, people will continue to publish in society journals where the money is not being asked. Uh, unless there's a new mechanism comes into the world uh, somehow to make it easier. I don't know. It's a very complex question, actually. Haseeb, do you want to, I know you followed some of the Plan S developments and you heard Mark Schultz this morning. What, what do you make of those developments from a Bangladeshi perspective? There are certain uh, agencies, I mean research organizations actually, who, who do go for you know, uh, open, open source, uh, open access uh, journals. But mostly they are not, uh, unless they have international collaboration, the, the, there is a specific money uh, to, to make your uh, publications available. Interesting enough, uh, in Bangladesh, uh, we have been doing agriculture research. Uh, we have been doing fantastic, actually, in agriculture research. But I have recently learned that to get your research out in the field, for example, we have 170 million people to, to, to feed them, uh, you have to increase the production. So you do it through research. But you don't need to have fantastic publication to make your research out in the field. You can just go through the seed uh, approval uh, committee. They will approve it, and your research will be available, and people will be getting benefit. So it has got nothing to do with research communication. So we are getting benefit out of research. Uh, but without going through the uh, high quality international open access publication. So this is, this is the real need, and this is the another need uh, for your personal uh, growth and the growth to the uh, scholarly world. So I think, uh, I'm not sure whether things will be that different, you know, if, uh, if it is, uh, for Bangladesh at least. I don't, I don't, I, I don't think so. Thank you. Maybe time for one final question, if we have any takers. Oh, I think you just got there first, Martin. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Martin Rittman from MDPI. Yeah, thanks for two um, very interesting talks. Um, so we're an open access publisher, and when we look at the, uh, the, the access statistics on our journals, it's a surprise if India is not in the top three for uh, readers of the journal. And just kind of referring to the, the, the previous question, um, is that an argument that's kind of used um, as, as a pro-open access um, 
uh, yeah, ar argument for, for getting funding for, for open access. And I guess just to add a, a short comment that, yeah, I mean, I think APCs have been great in terms of getting ac open access up and running, um, but I think it, yeah, we do need to look for coordinated mechanisms between funders um, to uh, yeah to find ways of of, of getting round the, uh, the, the 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 difficulty of uh, of of some researchers in, in publishing in, in open access journals, and that's something that I personally hope will come out of, of Plan S. Well, it's a catch twenty two. You see, there's a quite an interesting question. You know, people from, there are 700 universities in India, I don't know whether you're aware of this, right? Of that, at least, at least 200 universities are probably doing research, are giving PhD degrees, okay? Except these top 30 institutions that I talked about, 20, 30 institutions, most of these universities have very limited access to subscribed journals. So their option is to go for open source. So that's why you might see large number of hits on open source journals. It doesn't necessarily mean that you know, they're looking for open source information. And I'm sure all of you know this Russian agency which is putting down all your copyrighted material in public domain, right? <laughs> you're, you're aware of that, right? I mean, like, like, what are we trying to hide anyway? That's a fact, right? I mean, somehow people are trying to catch them, but they keep jumping. So there are some agencies who manage to, you know, some students, I mean, I know students have told me that I do this. I told them this is wrong. You can't do this. But then they say, look, what trend do you want me to do? So they're doing this. I can't stop. But it's happening. So people are now going through that route to get access. It's, it's, it's wrong. So what I'm trying to say is that counting the number of hits on an open source journal does not reflect the increase in activity only for the open source. It's related also to the other journals which they cannot access, so they're going through the other route. But there is, there is a discussion going, you see, I mean, as an administrator, I can tell you people have brought to me issues saying, you know, should we need to publish, should we need to buy both journal access, open source, and also the print version. All these discussions are going on, and you know, some people prefer printed versions, some people don't. I think we're going to go through, go through a tough time of decision making because library budgets are becoming smaller and smaller, but the cost of journals are going up and up. So somewhere we're going to have some issues. Uh, I don't know how we're going to resolve it, but it's going to become an issue, but you know. Okay. Thank you very much again to both of our speakers. Thank you. So it is very shortly time to go to the second workshop meeting back in the same rooms as before. Just a couple of housekeeping points. Firstly, do make sure you hang on to your badges if you come back tomorrow. Don't forget about the feedback surveys. We really want to hear what you think of each of the sessions and the, the conference as a whole. And finally, thank you to Copyright Clearance Center. They're the sponsor for the evening reception. So it's workshops now till half past five, and then it's the reception at 5.30 in the snow room, which is back where coffee was and lunch was served earlier. Thank you very much.